Okay, I just want to welcome Dave Costell. Thanks for joining us, Dave. And uh, we've been having a, a chat this morning with a lot of people, and I just wanted to sit down with you and talk a little bit about your your background and, and how you got into this field of exercise science. And, and uh, after that, how your career intersected with ACSM along the way. Yes. And uh, let's start with that. Well, uh, I guess my early background was basically physical education, uh, but my primary interest at Mine the start too. was just coaching. Yeah, you know, me was, too. Yeah. All I wanted to do was just, yep. I mean, my goal in life was to be maybe at a small college coaching. What sport? Uh, swimming was swimming. my sport, yeah. sport in college, and then uh, I coached both swimming and running. But uh, So I taught in public school for a while and taught biology. Oh. Mm -hmm. as, which was a minor in college, mm -hmm. but something I always liked. So as a result, uh, when I finally realized I wasn't going to teach public school the rest of my life, and I applied to graduate school uh, at Ohio State, I uh, was fortunate enough to hook up with some uh, other students whose interest was more in exercise physiology. I see. And the end result was that I began hanging around the laboratory with them and realized that you could make a living perhaps teaching and doing research, not realizing that I had kind of a real interest in doing research itself. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I uh, actually I was only at Ohio State for one year. Well, um, where did you do your undergrad? Well, I started at, at Ohio University. Oh, in a it's in Athens? Athens, yeah. 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 I, and at that point, I really kind of, I realized I was in interested in research then because I had to do an independent study project and I hooked up with a zoologist mm -hmm. and he gave me 30 rats to do surgeries on. You know, he just left me alone. Wow. And I realized that, well, that was a lot of fun. As and, an undergrad, uh, that's oh, yeah. pretty significant. Yeah, I mean, it was a great opportunity. And, it, and it's, as it turned out, when I was teaching in public school, I was doing projects on my own. You know, I'd, in my fr free time, in my uh, out of school time, I was had projects going of one sort or another, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I knew I was interested and in, curious about things. So uh, I always tried to link them to sport. Mm -hmm. So I'd try to figure out how you could swim faster or how you could yeah. turn out to run faster and so forth. So when I got into uh, Ohio State and got interested in the exercise physiology, uh, I had a, an advisor, Don Matthews, who had worked at Springfield with Karpovich. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of was part, of really my start. Uh, but what happened was that I was there for one year, just enough to find out what a laboratory was about. <laughs> and I realized I liked to do research. And then uh, he encouraged me, Don Matthews encouraged me to take a job at the State University of New York at Cortland uh, because they needed somebody to teach exercise physiology mm -hmm. and to uh, coach swimming hmm. uh, and uh, and cross country. Mm -hmm. So I left. Uh, and so I'd only had one year of doctoral work, and I went to Cortland and uh, coached and taught, and uh, ended up applying for grants, getting a grant to do my dissertation. Hmm. So it took me about two years to get my doctorate, and but only you one still year got of it study. Through, uh, Ohio State. Oh, oh. What, what year was that, Dave? Uh, I got my doctorate in uh, 65. Okay. Yeah, 65. Uh, so uh, I kind of shortchanged myself on the education side yeah, but you at Ohio were, State, yeah, but I learned so much in that year where I went on my own, got, got my grant to do my dissertation, did the dissertation, uh, and published it. What my, was your dissertation? It was on the effects of uh, changes in water temperature on uh, physiological responses yeah. to exercise. Mm -hmm. And the way I did it was I had to empty an entire pool without letting the administration know that. That's a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and fill it with cold water. And, and get people in and it. do all the research on a weekend and have it warm back <laughs> up by Monday. And so, and I did a couple of studies like that. Well, unfortunately, first article I ever wrote, uh, I submitted it on this stuff. I submitted it to the Journal of Applied Physiology. And uh, I was already a member of ACSM by that time because okay. I had joined in 60, uh, I think 64, 65, I don't remember which. Mm -hmm. But I was already a member of ACSM. So 
I submitted this paper to Journal of Applied Physiology, and it was accepted almost immediately. Well, that's you starting know, first, right at the top. Yeah, your first publication. So never thought much about that, but I came to the next ACSM meeting, and I was standing talking to someone, and I heard Al Craig was nearby talking to John Faulkner. Mm -hmm. And I heard him say, I'd like to meet this Dave Costell guy. And oh, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't figure out why. Well, he was the reviewer of the paper, yes, and that was that, it, that was Al Craig's area of interest. And he said, anybody that could use an, empty an entire pool <laughs> to do a research project deserved to have it published. <laughs> and so That's I always good. remember that. But that, so then when I uh, hmm. was at still at Cortland, mm -hmm. uh, I at that point I had met Jack Wilmore, who we, our careers paralleled. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been very close friends all this time. He was teaching at Ithaca College. Boy, that's close. Yeah, yeah. 10 miles away. Yeah. And so uh, we got to know each other. And it turned out we both competed for a job at Berkeley. And he got the job, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, because otherwise it would have changed my entire career. Yeah, because you ended up at Ball State. Yeah, and, uh, and <clears throat> as a result, uh, I'd applied for a number of jobs. The other choice I had was that uh, I was offered a job at Washington State, but I in knew Pullman? Phil Golnick was yeah, already there. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, well, you know, now you're gonna have guys wanting to do the same thing, so mm -hmm. that won't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made the right decision not to take that job mm -hmm. and took the one at Ball State. Uh, and they had nothing but a, you know, a storage room. Uh, but it turned out to be to my advantage wow, because yeah. they left me alone and I had the ideas, and I was able to get the grant money, and so it could develop the lab. Mm -hmm. But all that time, I was uh, had would go every year to the me ACSM meetings. Yeah. And the thing I was most impressed with in going to those meetings was the meetings were small, mm -hmm. so you really kind of got to know pretty most much everybody. all in one room at first. Yeah, well, I remember one of the first ones I went to was at Penn State. And uh, Bill Morgan was talking about that this yeah. morning at the Nittany Inn. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. That's right. And uh, it was a small group, and you really kind of got to know everybody. So next year, when you would go back, instead of only knowing six people, sure. you'd know maybe a hundred. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and as the uh, I guess the audience grew, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your recognition grew as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and I was of course fortunate to be doing research at the start of the running boom. And so, you know, they had all these clinics and things, so I was always involved in those. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when it comes to exposure, uh, being at the right place at the right time really made a big difference. Yeah. But that was my interest. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been, started running at that time, you know, in the late 60s, and nobody was running, right. really. Unless they were running away from something. Yeah, or, or they were... <laughs> Uh, everybody thought you were kind of weird if you were <laughs> right. a runner. And so when I'd go to meetings, I was always amazed. I mean, if I gave a talk on something about running, it would, the room would be jammed. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out there weren't that many runners, but they were all interested in running. Mm -hmm. And so then the boom was starting. So sure. uh, And then ACSM's growth was exponential at that yeah. point. Did you overlap or, uh, with uh, Harris and Bowerman? That, you know, on their that jogging article and all that. that yeah, was in I was. I knew. Sixties, I guess. Yes, I knew who he was, and and uh, and of course Cooper was yeah. very prominent yeah. at that time. Yeah. And so I think one of the, the fondest memories I have was I would been involved with with running, but it was still not real, real, really the big thing to have at a meeting mm -hmm. at ACSM because mm -hmm. it was more kind of basic laboratory science. Mm -hmm. So in 1972, I think, or maybe uh, 73, uh, I was asked to put together a symposium on distance running. And mm -hmm. I invited speakers like George Sheehan and uh, Jack Daniels, and I think mm -hmm. maybe Jack Wilmore was involved, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Morgan. Uh, so a lot of the guys who were very prominent mm -hmm. over the years in ACSM. Uh, to be on that, yeah. and I thought, well, you know, it, they had it as the last meeting and the whole thing, and I thought, well, there'll be no one there. And uh, when we got up to give the thing, it was jammed. Packed. Yeah, it was packed. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and I rem still remember to this day that uh, uh, George Sheehan was an unknown. 
You know, nobody knew who he was. Mm -hmm. I knew him because of his writing. Had he done his book then? No, or? no, he'd no. done nothing. Oh, okay. He had never given a public lecture before. I'll be darned. So I, uh, not knowing him, invited him, not knowing what a character he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got up to give the, the talks, and when I got, we got to the medical side, that was what he was going to cover. And I still remember that all the orthopedic surgeons were sitting in the front row, <laughs> and uh, we had a, a, just a regular table. And George got up to speak, and, and within probably 30 seconds, he was standing on top of the table <laughs> with his pant legs rolled up above his knees and his shirt off. And his, one of his first statements was, if you ever have a, a running injury, never go to an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> that was a good start. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, what have I gotten myself into? I invited this guy. Well, it turned out he was such a charismatic speaker that he probably did more for the whole I'll field of, of fitness and... Uh, running than anybody yeah. I ever knew. I'll be darned. Yeah. That's a good story. Well, so I think uh, mm -hmm. my involvement with the college, I remember I was uh, elected to the board very early because of, you know, everybody knew everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and I was probably on the board by 1968 or 9. Wow. Uh, you were pretty young. Oh, PhD I was very young. At that yeah, time. I was quite young. Uh, but the the guy that impressed me the most at that time was John Faulkner. Mm -hmm. John could speak at a level that was very easy to understand, and a guy that was really a good role model mm -hmm. for everybody in sports medicine. He knew how to incorporate uh, things of science mm -hmm. into, uh, uh, I guess, understandable, understandable uh, terms language. and the lay yeah. people could understand. Mm -hmm. I think that was a key to the popularity of ACSM because it sort of began showing science could contribute to sport. Right. right. And, uh, but then I, I was on the board for several years, and then uh, Tipton and those other guys <laughs> wanted me to run for vice presidency, mm -hmm. and then they kept after me to run for the presidency, but I didn't want to do it because mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to do research and do other things, and I never considered myself uh, much of a... Uh, an administrator, mm -hmm. but I was okay, you know, planning programs and doing all those things. Uh, but along the way, I'd been involved with a lot of the people who were very prominent in ACSM. Oh, yeah. Like, I worked with Bruce Dill back uh, in the late 60s, and uh, that was, you know, an important period of my life. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> and so, uh, 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 I, I don't know. I guess I finally gave in in the mid-70s <laughs> to run for president. And uh, there were a lot of things that happened during that period, which we won't put on the record. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one, one of the things I wanted to talk about, too, was um, I wanted to ask you the date of when you went to Ball State. I went there in 19... Uh, 66. Okay, and pretty, I mean, your whole career was Yeah, the whole career. Was there, Over the basically. years, I had uh, opportunities to move. Mm -hmm. uh, and when John Faulkner moved out of his laboratory position in the physical education department at Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, I was offered that position. Uh, but I realized then I'd already started doing muscle biopsy work or was on the verge of doing it. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to do that at mm -hmm. a medical school. Yeah. Uh, and so I could do a lot more at Ball State than I could do anywhere else. And mm -hmm. they appreciated all the things you, you know, it was, the lab was growing so rapidly mm -hmm. uh, with, fun, with funding and, uh, and I was starting to attract really good students yeah. and all of that. So I figured that wasn't a, a, a wise move. I so I made stayed a where good I was. Decision. <laughs> yeah, actually what it came down to, and John and I talked about this, the decision to stay at Ball State or to move to Michigan, mm -hmm. came down to uh, a negotiation difference in my request and what they would give of $500. So John asked me one time, why didn't you ever take that job at Michigan? I said, $500. Wow. You know, and That's uh, today, you know, wasn't many years later, I was, you'd make that much for a 30 minute talk. Right. <laughs> well, didn't you uh, do a lot of early work on hydration as well? well? All, yeah, but after I got to Ball State, you know, I was looking around for funding. I started doing dehydration studies mm -hmm. uh, on wrestlers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it became obvious that rehydration became an issue. And so I did probably the first study for Gatorade mm -hmm. when it was owned by Stokely Van Camp. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, 
they began to get a lot of opportunities to do work on rehydration because the drink industry was just getting popularized yeah. Yeah. and nobody was doing anything in that yeah. area. So I basically, uh, they were going to carbonate uh, Gatorade at one point with Royal Crown Cola. Oh, and those people were great. I, th I think they must have built my lab. Yeah. You know, well, we had well. a good understanding and, uh, and so I did a lot of studies on that and, mm -hmm. and uh, worked with the issues of uh, uh, dehydration and marathon running and because combined the two you know I'm right. still interested in running perfect yeah. yeah so it worked out very well mm -hmm. and uh, from there around 1970 I started doing more of the muscle physiology and uh, mm -hmm. biopsy work and uh, then I worked in Sweden and Phil Goldink and I turned out you know I turned down the opportunity to work out there with at him WSU, yeah. it turned out he and I ended up being office mates at uh, in Stockholm, when we worked with, we both worked with Ben Saltine. Oh yeah, and yeah. that was in '72. Did Larry Rowell work with him too? Larry worked, but not at the yeah. same time we did. Okay. Uh, yeah, Phil spent a year, and I spent a half year there, and it uh, uh, it was a very uh, rapid learning curve mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. because you know, as I pointed out, my experience. Uh, as a student, you know, I only, it took me a year and a half to get my PhD, which mm -hmm. meant I didn't learn much. <laughs> and, I, and so I was learning on the job. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to work with a guy like Phil and to work with Bengt and all the people at, uh, at the GIH in Stockholm yeah. uh, was a very important period. Mm -hmm. And then I continued on doing muscle research uh, well, for the rest of my career most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it probably wasn't hard then to attract good graduate students once you got... Well, it's funny. I, I, you know, it, what happened was I published so much on all of these sports-related issues, uh, you know, looking at running, looking at swimming, that what would happen was I attracted all the undergraduates who were runners or oh, swimmers yeah. who were interested in biology or science. I see. And so I would always end up with a laboratory full of... Uh, runners mm -hmm. and uh, that was great because mm -hmm. uh, they were great subjects. Yeah, you had some subjects. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't think anyone ever graduated from our lab without having a biopsy done so <laughs> you know that was kind of the, the hallmark of coming to the lab. Where, now were your, was your lab in physical education at Ball it State was, or what kind of a setup did well, you Well what there? happened was it was as I mentioned it was just a storeroom at one, when mm -hmm. I got there with no equipment Mm -hmm. So that I had to raise the money to buy all the equipment for it. And it wasn't long I'd applied for an NIH grant to study coronary heart disease. And uh, the money came through. So I had lots of money, but I had not enough room because I needed to hire people. Mm -hmm. So the people in the community, the physicians in the community, one particular physician and, uh, who was a very close friend, who was also a runner, uh, saw the problem I had and the next thing I knew he went out and raised the money to build a building for me. Oh nice. Yeah. Wow. And where else would that happen? So the end result was uh, that was another issue why I didn't move mm -hmm. because uh, I had such a tremendous relationship with the medical community yeah. uh, that uh, I was locked in and mm -hmm. so once they built the building the building was away from everything else. It was a prefabricated building, but it was, wow. you know, it was small. Uh, it was small at first. So you were self-contained. I was self-contained, yeah. and yeah. no one really knew where I was or paid any attention. That's good. <laughs> so I was very, I was far better known outside of campus than I was mm -hmm. on campus mm -hmm. until you know the popularity got to the point there were articles in, uh, you know, New York Times or, uh, you know, all over the place mm -hmm. about the research we were doing, and then they would suddenly re find out about it. Mm -hmm. The best story I have on that was I. Well, there were two. One was we hired a new president and a new provost. And the two of them I'd never met. But the two of them uh, were on a flight to Japan on United Airlines. And they open up the Mainliner magazine, and there's a full-page picture of me, <laughs> and it's titled Professor of uh, Perspiration or something like that, uh -huh. Professor of Performance. And maybe. it was at Ball it, State. It was, and they like, read it. Wait a minute. Ball State? This guy's at our university? <laughs> So no, more, no sooner did they get back than I got a call and, you know, uh, 
but it was better not to be uh, mm -hmm. known because I understand. you know you didn't know anybody anything mm -hmm. and uh, leave me alone. Leave me alone, and the people they were great. I mean, I did I, you have to uh, teach any undergrad oh, classes? Yeah, yeah I taught. Uh, I had a half load of teaching and a half load of research. And so I taught undergraduate, but then as our graduate program grew, mm -hmm. then uh, it became more and more uh, just graduate courses. Mm -hmm. And then around 1979 or 80, uh, we were approved to have a PhD program. So then I, uh, Ball State was great because they paid for everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's a very unique, Charlie Tipton pointed out one time, there's probably no place in the country where the university really supports the lab with personnel, mm -hmm. all the fellowships, wow. graduate yeah, assistantships. Yeah, that's quite a commitment. Yeah, and it's, of course, over the years, we've supported a lot of uh, graduate students off grant money, mm -hmm. but the university was always extremely supportive. Mm -hmm. So it was, I always used to get teased. You know, I'd go, uh, they'd say, why are you at Ball State? Mm -hmm. And at first I didn't know how to react. And then I thought, well, if I tell you I'm from Ball State University, you won't forget that. You won't mm -hmm. get it mixed up right. with Eastern Indiana <laughs> University. Right. So, right. so it's a it's a name that you can always rec uh, stick with recognize. Yeah. So uh, I've never I never regretted the time because it mm -hmm. was great. I always had just top notch students. I mean, yeah. I come to these meetings and see who's getting awards. You know, Eddie Coyle. Uh, I mean, so I he was one of your... Yeah, he was a master's student. Yeah, that was one of the things, that, and we're rapidly running out of time yeah, yeah. here, but uh, if you could comment, and I, I know you get in trouble because you forget some of your students. Well, I wouldn't want to name too many names. Yeah, you don't but, need to name too many names, but the, I mean, the idea, again, I've talked to basically the same with all everybody this yeah. morning, is... Uh, you have your students, and then they're in ACSM, yeah. and not only in ACSM, but winning awards and, yeah. and so forth. Well, so, I, yeah, uh, I mean, I look at this year, uh, Ed Coyle getting that award is, you know, but I look back at others that have been come before, mm -hmm. you know, Young Investigator Awards. Carl Foster was a, a postdoc with me. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah, and so, matter of fact, I did all the biopsies for his dissertation, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, I just, you know, John Ivey and mm. I mean, I could... Uh, on and on. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's not fair just to mention one sure. or two. But, uh, but I think the, the other thing that I was trying to get at, though, is that ACSM has become pretty much their home as far as where they're going to publish and where they're doing their best work. Yeah, and, I think that's true. I uh, find, though, that, I mean, they, they, I gave them a little, kind of a little start. But they've grown so far. Yeah. I mean, guys have moved down into molecular biology and the genetics and mm -hmm. all of those areas. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're publishing elsewhere now in yeah. a lot of scientific journals. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of them continue to publish in, in mm -hmm. uh, the college's uh, publications. So that also says a lot for this field that that work can now be published in these other mainstream. Oh, yeah. Journal. Yeah, I think and that that's wasn't right. always the case. No, we really, when we started, there were really very few places other than the Journal of Applied Physiology where you could go mm -hmm. if you had any sports oriented right. public or, you know, or thing. exercise or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that, and so when the journal came along, uh, then it became a primary source. Mm -hmm. But now you can see the expansion and the impact of exercise Absolutely. in the whole field. Yeah. Uh, and it's spread throughout other fields mm -hmm. that would never have right. incorporated exercise for anything other than a, to use as a model with some rodents. Yeah, so. Bill Morgan was saying the same thing for psychology. Yeah. And, you know, I think these things that have started here have now gained acceptance. Oh yeah. In these other fields. Oh yeah. Ex if you and said, evolved into fields of their own. Yeah. If you yeah. said if if I went to a meeting, let's say I went to the American Physiological Society in 19. Well, fortunately, there were a number of good people like Bruce Dill, who was president, yeah, and uh, yeah. Sid Robinson, and all mm -hmm. these people who were. That's kind probably of, a unique example. Yeah, but yeah. you could go to that that meeting, and you wouldn't feel like you were out of place talking about 
exercise and sport, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. physiology. Mm -hmm. But other meetings you go to, oh, yeah, you're a phys ed major. Right. Uh, you know, you probably don't know a whole Same lot. Same thing happened to me. <laughs> yeah. But that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not embarrassed mm -hmm. to yeah. say where your education was or what your major was. Mm -hmm. uh, I think exercise has, you know, gained so much importance yeah. in general health and in, our, in society you can see, you know, now it's becoming bigger and bigger Absolutely. and more important. And I think the college's role will continue to uh, contribute widely to that area. Well, if you, it led, like, um, I don't know if you made it to see the Surgeon General the other morning. No, I but, didn't, unfortunately. But it was amazing. I mean, here's the Surgeon General of the United States, and he just couldn't say enough yeah. about physical activity and ACSM, and, I mean, you know you've, You've made it when yeah. when that happens. Well, I think so. uh, one of the turning points might have been uh, back when Jimmy Carter was in the, in office, and he you know was a, started he was running. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anybody before that that would publicly run, mm -hmm. and the fact that he didn't make a big deal out of it, but you know it looked accept acceptable by the president of the United States, yeah. Yeah. and then subsequently, I think almost every president has been you know shown the mm -hmm. importance of being physically active. Active, yeah. Yep. Well, anyhow, we're sort of winding down That's here, fine. Dave, That's and fine. I just wanted to thank you for well, taking the time. I'm sure to, I didn't contribute much, but... Well, it, you did, uh, <laughs> to stop by and chat a little bit. Well, and uh, all the people I've talked to this morning, it, it, it all fits together. Yeah. So it's really well, neat. Well, Bill Haskell and, and Skip Knutkin and I were all sitting talking, and we started telling stories mm -hmm. about about things that you, that nobody ever knows about, <laughs> right. you know, the underside of, uh, and so we thought somebody ought to do a, uh, what is it called, an unauthorized book? An author, unauthorized version. Yeah, yeah, of the college. Okay, well, thanks, Thank Dave. You. I appreciate it very yep. much. Good luck with this project. Thanks a lot.